You are listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Evan Banks. And I'm Deanna Lee. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's April 7th. Americans are living longer and retiring later. As these trends continue, the workforce might experience a higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias than in past generations. This could have serious implications in the national security and intelligence communities. But up until now, there has not been any publicly available research on the topic. A RAND paper published this week provides the first look at what appears to be an emerging security blind spot. Individuals who hold or held a security clearance and handled classified material could develop dementia and unwittingly share government secrets. The risk that an individual becomes a national security threat because of dementia symptoms depends on many factors, such as the nature of the classified information they hold, how long the disclosure of that information could cause damage, and whether the individual is targeted by an adversary. The authors of the paper point out that the greatest threat might be newly retired national security personnel who regularly accessed top-secret material. Compared with security personnel who have been retired for a while, recent retirees are greater in number and have knowledge of more currently classified material. The authors emphasize that continued research on this emerging risk is important, and it should be paired with educating the current and retired security workforce and their families to increase awareness and recognition of dementia symptoms. Last year, following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Finland and Sweden applied to join NATO. And on Tuesday, Finland formally became an ally. According to researchers from RAND Europe, Finland brings several opportunities and benefits to NATO. Perhaps most importantly, Finland has deep experience assessing Russian capabilities and intentions, which make it key to defending what is now the alliance's longest land border with Russia. Finland also gives NATO a significant strategic foothold in Northern Europe, and because of its capacity as a highly developed market economy and democracy, and its first-rate military, Finland is likely to exercise considerable influence in shaping NATO policy. Many of Finland's contributions could be magnified if its neighbor Sweden is also approved to join the alliance. Currently, Sweden is still waiting for Hungary and Turkey to ratify its application. A short-term delay in Sweden's membership may not present too much of a problem from a security policy perspective. But a long-term delay could leave NATO's northern flank more vulnerable to an attack. In 2019, more than 1,600 U.S. schools operated on a four-day schedule. This is a number that has risen sharply over the past two decades, and it may continue to increase. The ideas behind the four-day school week are simple and appealing. A shorter week makes it easier to staff schools, which is particularly difficult for rural schools, because of their geographic isolation and lower salaries. Those in favor of the policy also say that a shorter work week could get teachers to reconsider leaving their job or bring retired teachers back into the classroom, and even reduce teacher burnout and improve job satisfaction. And for districts facing budget shortfalls, the shorter week could save money on school buses, school lunches, substitute teachers, and hourly employees, savings that they can then spend to preserve staffing levels or hire specialized staff, such as reading coaches. But what school district leaders may not be seeing is the downside of the four-day week. Recent RAND research shows that students in four-day districts fell behind their peers in five-day districts a little each year. These changes are small, but they accumulate over time. Our researchers estimate that after eight years, the damage to student achievement could equal that caused by the pandemic. In other words, the findings suggest that the potential long-term learning deficit related to one less day in the classroom is not trivial. 
Brand experts also point out that the four-day school week is often used to sidestep deeper underlying issues in schools, challenges that are complicated and difficult to fix, such as shrinking budgets and staffing shortages. A better approach to improving outcomes for teachers and students would be to address the root causes of these problems, because, in the long run, the benefits of a shorter school week might not outweigh the drawbacks. When Nancy Pelosi, as Speaker of the House of Representatives, visited Taiwan last year, China responded by encircling Taiwan with military exercises and firing several missiles through its airspace. This week, new House Speaker Kevin McCarthy met with Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen in California, opting not to make the trip overseas. The decision to remain stateside was made, at least in part, to help deter another aggressive reaction from Beijing. But according to Rand's Derek Grossman, holding the meeting on U.S. soil may not be a deterrent. In fact, he says, it could have the opposite effect. Quote, In this particular case, McCarthy is likely emboldening China. This is because Beijing may, perhaps rightly, conclude that acting assertively against Taiwan, as it did after the Pelosi visit, bears fruit. Grossman is careful to point out that, overall, high-level visits are generally regarded as necessary to enhance deterrence. But again, in this case, American visits to Taiwan and meetings with Tsai may simply irk Beijing, which could lead to greater instability. It reflects one of the main issues Beijing must worry about in the years to come. What Grossman calls the, quote, quieter and more painstaking processes of deepening U.S.-Taiwan security cooperation. Rare earth elements and other critical materials like lithium have been called the building blocks of future innovation. Some can be used to make tiny but powerful magnets, the kind needed to power the next generation of electric vehicles. Others can withstand extreme temperatures, strengthen metals, polish glass, or serve as chemical catalysts. Lithium, for example, is a key component of rechargeable batteries. And despite their name, rare earth elements are everywhere. Some are more common than lead or copper. However, they are difficult to mine and difficult to separate. This makes China's near-total domination of the rare earth market both an economic and national security concern. In a recent study, RAND researchers looked at how the U.S. might break its reliance on China for these critical but hard-to-source materials. Fortunately, our experts note that Washington is already taking some steps in the right direction. For example, the Pentagon recently increased its stockpiles of rare earth elements, lithium and other critical materials. And the federal government announced last year that it would invest billions of dollars in bolstering the U.S. battery industry and tens of millions more in building up capacity to separate and process rare earths. But for now, nearly all of the rare earth ore that comes out of the ground in the U.S. still ends up in China for processing into usable powders and metals. Our research highlights two keys to further reducing dependence on China. First, the U.S. can try to break China's grip on the market outright. This would mean investing in finding, mining, and refining new deposits of rare earths and other critical materials at home and abroad. Second, at the same time, the U.S. should brace for a possibility of a rare earth supply disruption, possibly from a diplomatic break with China or from an unexpected shock like COVID-19. Preparing for such a disruption would mean increasing how long companies can survive without Chinese inputs and reducing how long it takes these companies to get back up and running afterward. But... Perhaps the most important thing that U.S. policymakers can do is act quickly, because the investments made today could take a decade or more to deliver results. That's it for today's episode. You can learn more about the topics we discussed in the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. We'll see you next week. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis.